Later today, Bubba and I are going to move 17 steers into this pasture of mostly cereal rye, rye grass, hairy vetch, and clover. Maybe you've heard of hairy vetch as a cover crop. You've heard that it can fix over 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre. It's winter hardy. It produces tons of biomass per acre. Plus, it's a high protein feed for livestock. But is hairy vetch all it's cracked up to be? What are the risks in grazing it, and is it worth those risks? I'm Rob from Dowdle Family Farms, and in my mission to grow more of our pig and cow feed on our farm, I planted five acres of hairy vetch last fall to evaluate if it's good livestock forage, while also benefits in building soil health. I've been grazing the hairy vetch with cows and pigs now for weeks. In this video, let's discuss its use as a cover crop for livestock forage. First, let's talk about how it grows. Then we'll talk about how it's used. And finally, I'll conclude the video with the problems associated with grazing hairy vetch and some recommendations and precautions that are worth taking when you're grazing it with cows and pigs. Uh, now, hairy vetch is talked about as a winter hardy legume that can produce loads of nitrogen for successive crops. It can tolerate quite cold temperatures, though in my area in Mississippi, we're not pushing that cold tolerance much. Like many cool season legumes, we plant it in the fall. It sprouts, establishes a pretty strong root base, and really sits there until spring, and then it begins growing rapidly. In fact, in a matter of four weeks, it more than tripled its dry matter production on one part of the farm from 600 pounds an acre to over 2,200 pounds per acre, and it kept growing. As a legume, it fixes nitrogen with this symbiotic relationship with rhizobacteria. And a lot of that nitrogen is tied up through uh, nodules on the roots. Now, hairy vetch is most often talked about as a cover crop for row crop farming. In fact, most of the language used to describe it revolves around row crops. Occasionally I'll hear someone talk about grazing vetch, but in most of those instances, it's someone who's a row crop farmer who also raises livestock and grazes those cover crops like Gabe Brown. I suspect that a lot of the reason that it's not used as more as a forage crop is the seed cost. A 50 pound bag cost me $80 or so and plants two and a half acres. Um, Ladino clover is $150 for 50 pounds and plants 10 acres or more. All that to say, the clovers tend to be half the cost and there's a lot more information about frost seeding clovers, broadcasting them in the pastures and all. Further, I suspect that because row crop farmers can justify a higher seed cost if it offsets the nitrogen inputs that they use in their subsequent corn crops, that it has a benefit there. Now, hairy vetch has a low carbon to nitrogen mate ratio, meaning that the material breaks down fairly rapidly after it dies, and that that plant material is available more quickly to the crops that follow the hairy vetch. It is most commonly planted with a small grain like oats, cereal rye, triticale, and even ryegrass. As you can see behind me here, now when mixed with a small grain, it helps the small grain break down more rapidly as well, while also delaying how quickly the hairy vetch breaks down. And what this means is that if you need some delayed nitrogen inputs, like for a couple months, the small grains help delay that breakdown. Now this detailed carbon to nitrogen ratio is available in large part because it has been studied so extensively for row crop farmers and how important it is for the timing of their nitrogen input. If you have a garden, market garden, or anything like that, it may be worth uh, planting hairy vetch for those nitrogen inputs. Now let's turn to looking at planting it and grazing it. I broadcast this seed and then lightly disc the soil over the seed along with the rye, the ryegrass and such. In this field, uh, I got pretty shoddy results. This first year I've grown cover crops here and the soil is pretty poor. I got excellent results in uh, my field over there on the corner about three quarters of a mile away where I've grown cover crops there for years and have better soil. Uh, interestingly enough, I irrigated that, that field last fall in the drought and it outgrew this field by leaps and bounds. This field didn't germinate until December when we got some rain. However, uh, just in the last few weeks, in the last few days, it's caught up in terms of biomass production. Uh, and really it was only delayed by three to five weeks. You can probably tell that the hairy vetch here is three feet tall, just growing upright. But if I were actually to take the vine itself, the vine may be six feet tall, it's just growing on the forage. But right here in this part of the field, it sprouted really well. Further in the back, it did not grow very well. 
Now, as we turn our attention to grazing hairy vetch, let me mention that there is a lot of conflicting research information, and very little of it have I found is very useful. If you look into it, uh, you're probably going to get mixed results. So let me say, graze hairy vetch at your own risk. There's very little chance for bloat for hairy vetch, so that's one reason for actually grazing it with livestock compared to clovers. But generally, I found that most of the information is very negative because people uh, are grazing it after it goes to seed or they're grazing the seed or feeding the seed. Personally, if you have it gone to seed, I just would not graze it. It's not worth the risk and the problems associated with grazing it. I'm gonna focus here on cattle and pigs with hairy vetch because that's what I'm doing. Now, there are three different problems that are typically associated with hairy vetch. Um, they'll develop some nervous derangement um, is one. The second one is the cattle grazing a hairy vetch pasture. Uh, they tend to develop subcutaneous swelling uh, in the head and neck, along with some mucosal discharge, cough, and other issues. And there's a third issue with grazing it that shows up as dermatitis, uh, pink eye or conjunctivitis, whatever it's called, uh, diarrhea, and then producing lesions in the organs. There's a 1992 journal article that uh, talks about how it does that even when it's grazed in small grains and Bermuda grass. So how do we contrast with the fact that people do graze hairy vetch and why in the world would anybody grow it to graze? First, our cows graze a wild vetch, and maybe common vetch or something like that, that comes up natural, naturally in our pastures. And there's often a fear for grazing something new and either we don't try it or we hedge our bets. When we planted more clover in our pastures for the cows, I was preparing to turn the cow herd in there and my dad decided to spend uh, some money on bloat blocks, several hundred dollars actually. I wasn't sure that it was necessary. I'd put a bottle fed steer on clover and never had any problems, but I wasn't real confident about it yet. He wanted to hedge his bets and so I didn't talk him out of it. And it turns out it was not necessary for those bloat blocks for the clovers. But the concern and the fear drove us to use them. We wanted to hedge our bets. Likewise, you'll hear a lot of stories about uh, allowing cows to graze it. Yes, there can be problems, but there are also problems with other crops that we grow like sorghum sedan grass, hybrid pearl millet, and many, many others. It's just a matter of taking precautions and, and using some common sense uh, when we're grazing it. So how do we manage hairy vetch with cows? First, um, if you keep the younger animals less than three years of old, uh, on the vetch, uh, it tends to reduce the problems, though it can still have problems. Older cows tend to have problems with poisoning with vetch more than others. Uh, also keep it to less than 10% of your pasture stand. Uh, I do push the envelope some, but if I planted 10 acres and it gets to be 25% of the, of the forage, I'd just move the cows a little more quickly. Uh, a few days ago, I grazed a 50% vetch stand uh, but it was only for two days and I gave the cows a lot of fresh tender grass as well. Um, but those steers were on there, the same ones that'll be on here. Most of the problems tend to show up within 10 to 12 days of grazing vetch, according to that journal article. Third, graze it before it goes to seed when it starts flowering uh, or earlier. If there are seeds on your hairy vetch, if it's gone to seed, I would not graze it under any circumstance. It's just not worth it. Most of mine is just now starting to flower. And in fact, you may be able to see some purple flowers through here, uh, like the vetch flower here and here. Um, but these flowers are just beginning to open and a lot of them have not even opened yet. And so there's really not any seed. And when we start talking about grazing pigs on vetch, uh, there's a little different story. Cannabinine is a non-protein amino acid that is found in the seeds of a lot of different legumes like alfalfa, but it's also in vetch. It, it'll reduce the animal feed intake in pigs particularly. Even really small amounts of the seeds can impact their growth. There's a lot of biochemistry here that is well beyond my understanding. Uh, it's an anti-metabolite and it gets confusing in my mind anyway. But the short of a long story is it will reduce their feed intake if the pigs eat the seeds. I haven't found any information about whether this amino acid is in the vetch forage itself. I've read nothing to suggest that, but no one's really doing the search on that. 
So this is how I'm using hairy vetch with my pigs. First, I use it with my breeding sows and boar in their early stages of gestation. I let them graze it as long as there's no seed and I haven't seen any deleterious impacts. I have reduced their grain consumption. Remember, sows need a limited feed diet so that they don't have birthing problems, so it may be designed really well for them. If the sows are in milk, I avoid feeding the vet. If it's gone to seed, I don't want to reduce the feed intake nutritionally, and if it's in the forage, I don't want to reduce their feed intake either. In the future, I'll probably add a small amount of vetch to my feeder pig mixes this fall just to add some diversity, but I'll graze it before it goes to seed. Remember, I want more peas and clovers and brassicas in this mix, and that's kind of how I'm thinking I may do it with my feeder pigs this next fall. We'll just have to see how it works. Now, you may be wondering why it's worth growing hairy vetch to graze if there are so many concerns with grazing it. Remember, there are concerns with anything that you grow. Clovers cause bloat. Some of the best forages like sorghum sedan grass improve soil and fatten cattle beautifully, but they have their risks as well. Likewise, vetch has some really good benefits with its risks. If you're grazing cattle, you may not think it's worth grazing it at all. After all, there are a lot of clovers uh, and other wonderful legumes that will boost the protein and the cattle forage. However, with pigs, there's an entirely different story. If we're expecting our pigs to receive a substantive portion of their nutrition for muscle production on forages, they require a much more specific nutrition uh, amino acid profile than cows do. They need diverse, high-protein forages that help provide a balance of the essential amino acids. The way we do that is growing high lysine feeds for pigs like buckwheat, winter peas, and others, and then we make sure that the other high-protein forages are in the mix in diverse ranges that'll help balance the amino acid profile that the pigs need. That means that adding some hairy vetch might be just what we need to do. Now, there are reasons to be concerned about grazing it no matter what animal you're grazing it with. Even though it tends to be more expensive on a per acre basis, it does offer some decent forage. It offers good soil building characteristics. Just be informed, give it a try, and be careful about how you're growing it. If you're interested in more cover crops that you can grow for pigs and cattle, check out this playlist on cover crop species profiles. It'll help you out a lot. If you got some value out of this video, it'd do me a world of a lot of good if you'd share it with everybody you think would get some value out of it and enjoy it. Don't spam them, but do share it. It'll help get the message out. Until next time, take care and have a great day.